today we want to actually talk about the power modern work and security, and it's going to be driving more towards the E5 security stack. So where the Microsoft side is on E5, everything around M365 E5, if you could think of Office 365, E5 skew around ATP, phishing, and those type of things, DLP. The endpoint E5 is around deal, it's around more around Defender for endpoint. And obviously the enterprise mobility and security side of E5, cloud app security, Defender for identity, and those type of tools. Norm, if you want to move slides. But we're actually going to do this a little differently today. We're going to drive it towards different scenarios. And we'll probably touch on the technology as we go, absolutely. But we definitely want to push forward on the scenario side of things. <clears throat> Norm, do you want to move? Unless you did yeah. and it's slow. There you go. Perfect. You see it? Okay. Yep. So what I want to kick it off is we're going to actually handle this a, kind of like a, this old house uh, series where I'll be Kevin O'Connor, the host. Norm. Norm will be uh, the contractor side of it, this is me, Tom Silva. But ultimately, we want to drive into this conversation on both sides of it. So very back and forth, and feel free to ask questions in the chat, and we'll answer them. Um, but if we look at E5 around maximizing security and compliance and analytics, one of the things, Norm, I'd like you to dive into is the zero trust, I think, is where this starts, right? This is where the benefits lie on a whole zero trust framework, if you want to go dive into that a little bit. Absolutely. And, you know, when we think about zero trust, this all comes around the fact that all of our identities and all the activities that we've had in the past where they're protected by this large monolithic security stacks that protected everyone's side. Now everyone's on the outside. So now you have to worry about that, that identity is the new perimeter. So now what we're looking for is verify explicitly. And we're looking to things not only just that the identity and, and making sure that that is that person, but we're looking at device health and what kind of application they're using and whatever anomalies that might be out there. They come in from some odd location or they come in from an odd time of day. Uh, the other one is a big, the main pillar here is that least privileged access. We're talking about just in time, uh, uh, actually authorization. Things like, for example, if you're an admin or exchange admin, you should only have that for a certain period of time and then the rest of the time you relax back into your normal state. Uh, also enough, just, just enough access. You know, again, if you just need to be the exchange online administrator, no sense being a global admin, pull that back a little bit and give you just what you need. And then of course, we usually look at looking at uh, risk-based adaptive policy. So basically not only just the, uh, the aspect of you're there, but actually what the context of where you're at and what you're up to and what you're looking at. And those tie back into our data protection uh, policies and the like. So, and the last one, but not least, and this is something everyone should keep in mind is always assume a breach. You know, the idea here is that uh, no one is safe anymore, and what you really need to do is to mitigate any sort of uh, breach or problems that you might have. That talks about SIG mining your access in your network, making sure you're all encrypted, and again, taking advantage of different tools, like, like for example, within the M365V5 suite that talks about threat detection, posture visibility, and the like. So that's what I mean by uh, zero trust, Joe. Yeah, so let's let's dive in. If we look at the multi-dimensional threat protection, I know you have you have a slide on here that kind of shows where everything ties together, and more mm -hmm. importantly, even with the identity and access management. Can let's dive into because I look at it as identity is the key, hundred percent. Everyone agrees, right? The identity is the door. The identities have to be good. They have to be in the cloud. Um, but ultimately, that's the first thing the user is going to interact with is their username and their password. Um, but then show let's show the audience what other controls. Damn, you nailed it. Uh, very, yeah. this is scary to look at everybody, but I think as we walk through it, you'll see how it all ties together nicely is around wrapping the zero trust into the tool sets from a user to the device to the sources that they're trying to access. Yeah. So along those lines too, just as Joe said, we've got multiple signals that are coming into this conditional access scenarios where we're basically looking at what's actually the user risk, what's the device risk, what applications are using. Again, what is the context they're coming into? Are they coming from different locations? Uh, example of using the privileged identity management for uh, out of Azure to basically increase, increase trust. So if you're going to elevate yourself from, from a normal user to an exchange online administrator, that may, may require an MFA. It may require basically a, a second or tertiary type approval as well. And as you flow through the environment, as you move from left to right, you'll see you're actually, once you get in the environment, there's still other things to be concerned about. Let's say, for example, is what is your context and what's what your behavior is going on and what type of data you're trying to access there. And you'll find that these dynamic uh, uh, data protection policies come into play and they'll start to 
assess that that risk level for that data with respect to where that user is coming from and what they're up to and where they've been. And likewise, that spans across the different applications and then back into the uh, the rest of the world. But the main thing here, too, is the thing to keep in mind is that there's multiple singles coming together. There's Intune working with Microsoft Defender for endpoints that tie back in with the, the user and risk policies. And that's really what sets that context for getting you in. And Norm, when you mentioned the signals, I don't know if everybody looked at the Microsoft Secure yesterday, but like... Early last year, Microsoft communicated around 24 trillion signals they were handling on a daily basis. November of last year, they communicated it was about 47, I think, 45 uh, trillion signals a day. Just yesterday, they announced that they're working through 67 trillion signal security events, signals a day. So now when you tie all of this together, what I like about it, it's an ecosystem approach. Like Norm said, I mean, one solution in the Microsoft Cloud will talk to the other. You can do your actions. You can do your conditional access your policies against all those signals that are talking to each other. So if you think of the benefit Microsoft has, 67 trillion, they're learning from all these events. So their learnings and how they're gonna improve is only gonna help anybody here who's able to take advantage of the ecosystem itself. Now, next I'd like to tie into is the UEBA or the Advanced User and Entity Behavior Analytics. And that's, we know that I guess another term for that pretty much is Defender for Identity. And if you wanna dig into that a little. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So Defender for Identity, actually, this started out uh, several years ago as Azure ATP. But really what it is, is it's basically agents that are put upon the domain controllers in an on-premise environment, and they start to watch behavior. They start selling, sending telemetry back up into the cloud. And machine learning takes over, and they start to watch and understand what the normal behavior is within that, uh, that on-premises environment. And they start to watch for things like lateral movements of identities and different other suspicious behaviors that would be indicative of something that might be a foul with respect to people basically breaching inside that organization. Now, this information gets fed right back up into that that basically I can I don't have a picture of that right now but it gets fed back into the the entire Azure uh, space within your tenant and that gets filtered back up and brought together with respect to some other telemetry that might be indicative of, of problems that might be happening so and as you mentioned too this 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 advanced user and user behavior analytics that also ties back in with the uh, as we talked earlier just about the risk-based uh, adaptive uh, data loss prevention things basically we're talking about you may be behaving in a way that uh, we didn't anticipate you to consequently your risk level is coming back up especially if you're accessing or trying to access this very sensitive data and and we're to, to the last bullet here the streamlining operations i'm curious i mean you can you can type in the chat but if I look at five, seven, eight years ago, many customers we used to speak to used to do best of breed. Everything was best of breed. I know one customer that had literally the best of breed of every IT stack in the organization. That was good and good and bad in some ways. Nowadays, we do find many customers do trying to consolidate. And this is where the streamline operations piece comes in, is actually pulling these tools together, consolidating the tools, which not only consolidates cost, it can consolidate support costs, training costs, operational costs, but then you get more efficient and the benefits of the tools together. I don't know, Norm, if you want to dive into that a little bit more? Yeah, and you know, the other side of that too, Joe, is the fact that it's it any one of these point solutions may be quite excellent and really do the job that's intended. But the fact of the matter is since they all are disjoint and there's a requirement somehow to be able to knit those back together and bring in that different telemetry and be able to to uh, to commingle it together and basically correlate it together. Time is of the essence there. And, and as you can see here is that, you know, when attackers move through, they're using these polymorphic type uh, attack vectors that, that change as they move. And sometimes uh, even minutes can seem like actually years at a cyber basically time frame. So what I'm saying here is that time is of the essence. And, and sometimes even on the best attempts here to try and knit this data together, there's always something that goes afoot and data either gets lost or it gets delayed and that could consequent into some sort of uh, issue that you might have to deal with later. So, and as you're saying, Joe, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is what I wanted to bring up. This ties back with that that other what you were just talking about the number of or the number of organizations that have a, a large number of. Uh, uh, solutions within their vendor suite. 47% had 11 or more, and we're basically taking a third more, had relied on more than 25 of these solutions at a time. And uh, along that line, organizations start to realize that uh, that's not necessarily such a good deal. And as you, oops, I'm not sure if you can see that slide or not, my screen just blinked. Yeah. 
But but here we're talking about, you know, basically 65% of the organizations, they start to realize these efficiencies of being able to consolidate vendors and get down to a single point. And again, that's not just from the, as you said, the management side of things, but basically think of all the effort and, and training and skill sets that are required for all these different point solutions, as opposed to looking at something that's consolidated. And again, you say, well, I'm, I, I buy off of that, enterprise agree, or inter consolidated enterprise solutions are great, where does Microsoft fit into this? And all I can say about that is if you look at the industry pundits and you look at uh, basically the different uh, uh, analyst uh, panels and things that are out there, you look at IDC, Gartner, uh, Forrester, they're all rating the entire, what I call, you know, people might refer to this as a, uh, a solution suite. I think of Microsoft's E5 solutions as more of a fabric. Those all tie together like, uh, 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 as the best, I mean, again, they, they're, they're highly rated, they're fully integrated, and they, they deliver value that uh, really is, it's, 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 I think it's almost difficult, if not impossible to beat. I'm sorry, I'm just a little biased, so you might guess, so. No, but you're right. I mean, I think you nailed it. If you look at Gartner, if you look at Forrester, the others, I mean, Microsoft, just in the past few years, right, has moved to the top right quadrant of many of those from a value and feature sets. Um, so they're driving strong. And I even think they announced yesterday they're increasing their R&D from a security side to even drive it that much more. Yeah. So again, consolidation is important mm -hmm. and making sure you consolidate on the right solution is important. And again, it's, it's that's a tough, their value proposition is really tough to uh, to go against in that sense. Great, let's move to the next one. Mm -hmm. So now if we look at the next part of security, obviously is internal risk through endpoint protection. So the device, as you everyone knows, a lot of us here, I can see just from cameras, you may be home, you may be in the office, but the point is the device is everywhere. So not only it's, it's not where we used to be always in the office. It was very easy to secure the device. The device is always on a secure network. You really didn't have to worry about it too much outside of user interactions with that device. But now the device is everywhere. Um, so when you tie in the endpoint protection, this is where the E5 comes in from Defender for Endpoint tied to the cloud analytics and those types of capabilities. But then you also have the benefit tying it into Intune and all the capabilities of Defender and Intune. So now you can say if the device is not compliant, it can't access certain data or vice versa, tie it into the conditional access that Norm showed earlier on to where, hey, if this device is not in the office, maybe I'm wrapping additional security controls on it. Norm, I'd like to, one of the key things I'd like you to dive into is that device local DLP classification, because that's, I would say it's newer, uh, more last year, but I think it's very important from a device side. Yeah, well, well, you know, it's important here. One of the biggest problems that you have with, with trying to classify and label your data is exactly trying to find it and then be able to identify it properly. And, and certainly there's, with, if you look within my, Microsoft Information Protection, there, you have that ability to define sensitive information types and be able to define that as what, how that would be labeled as, as super sensitive or basically normal everyday flow of things. But the idea here is, especially with that super sensitive information, when it's actually created or accessed, that's when it should be labeled. And what we have here is on these device local DLP policies, they're actually actually on the Windows workstation themselves. So if someone's actually creating an email or a, or a SharePoint object or something in OneDrive, and it actually matches some of the, what we consider one of the sensitive information types that have been defined for the organization, that would automatically label it. And, th and that doesn't mean that the, the 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 author can't come back and override that in certain circumstances. But for the most part, it, the idea here is to, to is to label it as quickly as possible and make sure that it is being as protected from basically its birth all the way through its entire life cycle. And and it, the same thing happens when it actually accesses the data. Let's say they're basically someone's open up a share uh, a SharePoint object. They look at it and and basically this is what we consider a sensitive information type. At that time, it'd be labeled as well. So it's just a it's a it's a it's more than a handy way. It's an essential way basically as this data is being created to, to get it turned in and, and labeled and identified right out of the gate rather than waiting and do some sort of scanning mechanism or go back and try and work through some other process that would come back and apply the, the appropriate labels. And the main reason for that is, that is to protect it from the beginning, not let it sit and wait for something to come back and try and label that in a, in a batch type fashion. Yeah, now if I jump back up, one of the things I want to talk about that automated endpoint detection, because the benefits of the E5 SKU is it gives you that cloud AI and the cloud learning to be able to do those automated uh, assessments and automated risk assessments and remediations. And the insight from our side, we've been working very closely with Defender for Endpoint on this front. Uh, on more importantly, right, is how do we help customers adopt it? How do we help customers realize the value, see the value? But I think more importantly with that automated endpoint detection, how do we make it easier, right? How do we make it to the point where the moment something is detected on a device, we can automatically remediate, automatically block it, automatically quarantine it until it's fixed, instead of someone actually trying to monitor the entire time and provide actions against that. 
Norm, I know you've been living the Defender for Endpoint for this past uh, probably a year now. Yeah, <laughs> quite a uh-huh. bit. I don't know if you have any pointers to add into that one. Well, you know, the other side of that, too, is not only is the, you have this automated response that comes into play, but there's this other element of what I call vulnerability management. And we don't necessarily pull it out on this particular slide here, but that's a key element of Defender for Endpoints, where basically they'll come back and they'll, the, as you said, you, you, Microsoft is pulling in 65 trillion signals a day. They're coming back and doing the research or sharing information with the other organizations that identify CVEs. And that information comes back and gets contrasted and reconciled against the uh, the software libraries and configuration settings on, on individual workstations. And you get a very comprehensive report of vulnerabilities in your environment with respect to priority and what stations are there and what basically would be the remedial actions that are necessary to address the, 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 the problem and mitigate that vulnerability. So that's where it comes back. And again, this, this all goes hand in glove together. You know, the automated uh, uh, remediation and endpoint detection, as well as this other side of it, where you're basically continuing to keep your workstations at the, the, the highest mitigated level you can with respect to the vulnerabilities that exist in the environment. Cool. Let's jump to the next one because <clears throat> now there's, this is the part I think Norm and I both like a lot is the whole compliance. As we talk about global you know, GDPR, if you talk about government, you have GCC, I mean uh, CMMC compliance, that's GCC types of tenants. This is huge because now we can take all those configurations and everything we can do from the cross the stack, but more importantly, tie specific configuration, specific settings into a compliance or regulatory requirement that the customers are, you you may be trying to drive. Everyone's different, right? Sarbanes-Oxley, HIPAA, all those others. Um, like I said, I mentioned CMMC, GDPR, California now has their privacy laws. Um, but in turn, <clears throat> Norm, dive into here, because one of the things I'd like to, because it's a real world experience is we worked with a customer, Norm was instrumental there, where it was a government-based contractor who needed to meet a specific compliance. And can you walk them through how being able to tie all of this together to be able to meet that type of a compliance requirement? Yeah, exactly. And they, and they were a cloud-only environment, so they did have some advantages over one that's basically a hybrid uh, space. But nonetheless, they basically had all the same problems and issues that would show up, let's say, with the, one of the largest contractors or, or government vendors. So they were looking, again, to address all these cloud controls and not only be able to address them and put them in place, but also do the auditability against those. And that's, that's a key portion of this as well, is making sure that the uh, the audit trails are being captured on, on identity access management, You know what's going on in the vulnerability management area, what's going on with the endpoints and where they're at. So we were able to take this particular customer and we went through and uh, we went through each every one of the components and we went through and and mm-hmm. and took them up to what we consider was a satisfactory level now you can take again it's just it's just like you can take people quite a raise down and you might find that the end user uh, experience is a little bit tenuous sometimes and that's how you certainly happens in the gcc environments mm-hmm. but you'll find is that we're able to pull that back a little bit so we still have a satisfying end user experience and we're still able to meet all the controls and when i say meet all the controls they were actually going through a process where they're, they're looking for CMMC level two and ultimate level three compliance. The first step in the journey was an ISO 27001. And we had basically put all these controls in place with that client. And uh, they had an order to come through and they were basically doing a pre-CMMC level two, level three-ish type audit because none of that stuff really was in place at time, but they're just warming up and making sure that they were looking at least that they were addressing the big key components that are necessary for that compliance. And what they what was also happening too is that the auditor they had in was actually being audited themselves. So they went through with a fine tooth comb and they looked at the whole range of cloud controls and the and the audit trails that came back out of that. And they gave the customer basically uh, a a gold star rating. It says we've never seen uh, basically a, a clear, more defined, better documented, and and easily to view and 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 validate. The system that we've ever ever been for, and they again, they, they of course they accolades on us as a, as a vendor, but also accolades on Microsoft as well for having all the componentry necessary to be able to deliver that in a unified way. And and, and the cool thing is too, I mean, you can do this yourself too. I mean, with Secure Center, uh, Secure Score, and you can couple that with a Compliance Center, you can build those two together. And again, at least you can look at the the, the broad spectrum of technical controls that are necessary to achieve these levels of certification. So, for example, if you want to hit an NSAID 800 171, you're basically looking somewhere around 340-ish type controls. 
you can come and do basically accomplish all of those and be able again to validate where you're at by looking at secure score and basically using that, uh, that compliance center and that certification uh, template. Keep it in mind, there's a lot more to being certified than just getting the technical controls in place, but it's a big hurdle to get over on your, on your path to be able to hit that certification. I think the good thing there is this customer was in a commercial cloud tenant and they were to reach the, that level of a CMMC. So they, they were able to do it before actually going into a GCC or GCC high, which is a completely different type of environment. But you have to understand that the fact that they could do it in the commercial side, because commercial tenants tend to usually have more feature sets than a GCC or GCC high type of tenant if you look at the Microsoft cloud. Um, so it gives you your end users experience, got administrators wise, um, but the ability to still meet that compliance with all the controls that are available in the tenant. So it's a great, uh, something to think about if you have to go that route. And if you are on here in the GCC or GCC high, you really got to wonder. I mean, there's features in Teams, just my regular user-based features that aren't available yet because it's the type of tenant it is. A lot of customers we're talking now, they're questioning, do I need to be in this type of tenant? Can I back down, get all the features I need, but still secure it to where I need to go? Now, CMMC, obviously, level three, four, and five, 100% are going to require uh, more of the GCC and that level tenants. But, but what I'm trying to say is there's so many controls and across this entire ecosystem that you can pretty much meet most of your regulatory requirements quite easily by these configurations. And, you know, even if you're not trying to hit some sort of level of certification, it certainly makes your internal auditors happy. And I can tell you that they are going to gain, they're really more focused and they're starting to give you more and more scrutiny to what's going on in the cloud environment. So you can't escape it one way or another. Great. Next. Now, when we mitigate new and threats employee education, this is where we're kind of tying everything back that we just talked through the past few slides, right? It's the ecosystem of all these tools. So Defender for Office, you look at phishing attacks, you look at DLP and those type of things, Defender for Endpoints, we talked through all these. Uh, Defender for Identity is, the, is what Norm talked about on the first slide. But as much as all these tools tie together, you still have the weakest link in this conversation is the end users. Right, and I think this is where it comes into for around the education and the abilities that the Microsoft Cloud with E5SKU comes in on helping to educate the users. And Norm, if you want to dive into a little bit on the phishing campaigns, I think is one of the things. But again, as much as we can make this environment, any environment, as secure as possible, if we don't educate users on what and how they should be doing things and how to handle certain scenarios, they're still going to be your weakest link, and ultimately, they're still going to be the ones that let people in the door. Um, so you want to go a little deeper, Norm, on the whole education yeah. side. Well, you know, you, you covered it pretty well already, but it's that, you know, the, the key thing here too is like, well, you know, it, it is, you have to keep this in front of everybody's mind and you and everybody can be fooled from that. And that's where everybody, you have to be really mindful all the time that this is always looming out there. Because again, quite frankly, is, you know, we've made everything so hard to get in through the, these, these normal pathways that the bad guys would come through. Now they basically, well, the easy way is just ask for a user ID and password and in they go. So phishing is still the number one problem. It's still the number one problem. And again, as Joe pointed out, we can have the, all the most comprehensive and complete safety controls in place with respect to securing your environment and uh, it's gonna fail. It's just like all the, the safety equipment that they put in modern cars will not get keep people from getting in accidents if they're bad drivers or they don't pay attention to the rules of the road. But the main thing here is the phishing campaigns, they're, they're, they're very realistic, they're very timely, they give great feedback, they, they'll direct people back into some spe specific and, and focused training with respect to what it is that they've done wrong. And in addition to that too, there's, there's even though it's kind of hidden here, as you think about the, the data protection uh, policies, data loss protection policies that are in place, we can put in uh, various policy tips and reminders about why people shouldn't be doing things. And it's, you know, it's not a really a good idea to be sending uh, uh, basically personal identifiable information in any sort of chat or any sort of move. Those things all come together. And it, to a certain degree, that's part of that phishing campaign. So in, I'm not sure what else to say, Joe, other than the fact you need to have the whole whole enchilada here to basically deliver what we're looking for with respect to uh, a good security posture. And I think when we talk about the consolidation and all the entire ecosystem, the nice part about this E5 SKU is now you can tie it into the security on the Azure side and then pull everything into, you saw that you see the deep integration with Sentinel. So now remember, I said Microsoft's dealing with 67 trillion signals a day. You're going to have the ability now within your Microsoft Cloud environment to pull all those signals into Sentinel to now be able to create run books, workbooks, and um, automations and remediations according to what fits your business. Yeah. And this certainly looks like, again, uh, overly busy, but really it just shows the integration points of all the controls and, and, and uh, solutions that micro has, Microsoft has within their suite. 
All right, we can wrap it up. <clears throat> yep. So two two slides left, and we'll get you to the uh, the fun part, right, of the gifts and the trivia. So how we handle this solution with our customers is we usually start what we call an envisioning session. So if you're not fully aware of this Microsoft Security Stack, uh, we can work with you and sit with you. I think it's usually about a two hour thing, two to three hours, and just go through the product suite, what it is, how it does, where it can help your business. Maybe what are you looking for from a business requirement standpoint? Where do the technologies fit in? And again, it's just to give you a good understanding of where the E5 SKU fits into your world. Next option we have, we talk with customers, what we call a modern endpoint roadmap. And that, that's my feed. This is my favorite one because it helps a customer understand where are you today across devices, security, applications, collaboration, network, everything you could think of. And then where's your business requirements and how can you get there from this entire ecosystem that we're showing you, right? What would benefit you? What would what may be another option for you to go to if that's if that's to your best approach? Um, but the benefit now is we're talking not only to your IT department, your end users, your network, your phone people, uh, the people who support the desktops, your CISOs, and tying that holistic view into an actual roadmap and how to move forward. And then we have your typical consulting services. So it's project-based work that we tend to help our customers with assess, design, help these, get these products implemented. But then lastly, we have managed services tied to these. So obviously managed security for compliance is everything we've talked here. It's taken that entire E5 SKU, setting it up to meet your compliance requirements and then but handling it day to day for you, monitoring for drift, monitoring if any changes occur and making sure you get back on track to where you need to be. Defender for endpoint is just, it's setting up the defender for endpoint for your environment across all your device types, sending it to either Sentinel or we have a solution on our side that we can then help you react to any events that come up. And then lastly, we round out those two with managed Office 365 and managed endpoint. So managing that product productivity suite and then managing the day-to-day -day of an endpoint side. And the main reason why I tell customers why Insight, you may be thinking, well, why am I gonna go to Insight for these type of services? I mean, just look on the right-hand side. I mean, the 12 Microsoft Solution Specializations, uh, Microsoft Awards, we're 11,000 people globally. So we have these capabilities, not only in the US, but also EMEA, APAC, Canada. Um, so, I mean, we have resources that are not only onshore, offshore, and nearshore. So we can even provide some follow the sun type of work, depending on what's needed with your environment. But again, we're tied to the hip with Microsoft. We work, we meet with their product teams. Uh, we work very closely with the account teams to help you better understand if there's funding involved uh, that you want to do work with. We help you work with to get the funding that is available from a Microsoft side to ultimately drive these type of um, solutions and more importantly, the licensing and everything that are tied to it. Good. Next slide. Now, if you want to, for more information, definitely scan the QR code. Uh, we can keep it up for a little bit, um, but then just provide your information into the QR code. It'll be a slight form, and we'll glad that we can reach out to you. We, like I said, we could set up that envisioning session. That is no charge to you. I mean, the envisioning session is for us to be able to help educate you on what the solutions is and what the value are, what the value would be. 